Good evening, good evening. Welcome to Key Road Baptist Church. It's good to have you here on our final service uh, with Brother McCracken and his wonderful wife, Nancy. Uh, I am so thankful that I've been a part of these meetings. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer. Ask God to bless us this evening. Our Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to come and meet together. What a privilege we have to live in a country where we have that freedom. God, may we not take it for granted for one day it might be taken from us. God, I pray that tonight hearts will be ready to receive the message from you. Each one of us, you have a message. You have something you want to say to us. There may be some here tonight, Lord, that do not know you as Savior. May tonight be the night of their salvation. God, I pray that those that are here tonight, uh, the child of God, the Christians that have been forgiven, and made righteous through your blood, that we consider, do we care? Have your will away, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Revive Us Again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins, has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. You may be seated. Turn in your dark blue hymnals, just in case. Dark blue hymnals, Jesus and Me. I don't know how many know this song. Kind of an old quartet song. Love quartet songs. Jesus and Me. How many know this song? He goes, yeah, yeah, okay. 193, 193, hang on a sec, we'll get there, we'll sing it a little slower than the quartets do, here we go, I traveled alone upon this lonesome way, my burdens were heavy and dark was my day. I looked for a friend, not knowing that he had all of the time been looking for me. Now it is Jesus and me for each tomorrow, for every and every sorrow I know that he upon my new found friend and 
so to the end it's jesus and me the road may be long to heaven's pearly gate i know that it's narrow i know that it's straight but jesus is there through eternity we'll travel along just jesus and me now it is jesus and me for each tomorrow for every heartache and every sorrow i know that i can depend upon my new found friend and so to the end it's jesus and me forever i'll sing of his great love for me forever i'll tell it on land and on sea i'll stay by his side contented i'll be for all of my life it's jesus and me sing it out now now it is jesus and me for each tomorrow for every heartache and every sorrow i know that i can depend upon my new found friend and so to the end it's jesus and me i pray that it is jesus and you tonight stand with me we'll sing change my heart oh god sing this in a prayerful mood if you will singing it to to god and as you sing it i pray that you can mean the words here we go change my heart oh god make it ever true change my heart oh god may i be like you you are the my heart oh god make it ever true change my heart oh god may i be like you amen you may be seated Hallelujah. Thank you for being here tonight. That's a blessing to see you. I'm grateful you're here. I'm looking forward to what we're going to do tonight. It is, uh, I, I, I really do, I told you the other day, I think my favorite message of the week is uh, the little maid on the Sunday afternoons when we did it and so on. But what we're doing tonight, it's incredible. Uh, the, the obvious work that God did in Naaman's heart and in his life. We're going to get to see that. That's a blessing. So I want to say a thank you for being here. You folks that have got to make it every night, God bless you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, you that have got to come some, and you've been faithful to do that, thank you. Thank you for being here. Of course, anytime friends and guests have come, we're always grateful that you've come and you're with us tonight. Thank you for 
in with us. And uh, so last night, it's hard to believe how quick it goes. Uh, uh, I'm supposed to ask somebody, I forgot who it was, I think it's Debbie, I'm supposed to ask about Miss Nina's address. Somebody have that? Well, I, you, that doesn't help me. You just have to write it down and tell me after church. I won't actually pull it right now. Anyway, but somebody knows it, uh, and evidently she has two addresses. So, uh, <laughs> but if anybody's give that for, because I was telling the pastor today, I said, you know, I don't know why I waited till tonight at, while we were eating that I knew she couldn't come, and I said, it's just I can go see her, and I'm going to be here uh, tomorrow and part of Friday, so uh, I can. Uh, hopefully be able to drop by and see her and pray with her it's a blessing because actually the reason I come to California every January and now most of February and sometimes includes March but I come because of Pastor Jerry Delaney who's the one that started all that uh, when I first went into evangelism I I never came on Sundays I came here like five years in a row Monday through Friday or Monday through Wednesday and Anyway, I called him and said, hey, brother, I said, I can come on Sunday this time. He goes, how can you do that? I said, I'm not pastor anymore. Well, why not? And so then he began to interrogate me and so on. He goes, well, since you're coming, you want me to see if there are some other churches that want you to come to their place? I go, yeah, that would be great. So he, I think it was five other churches. It was County McKee Road. There was five other, six places. And he let me use his car that first year that I came full-time like that, and I wrecked it twice. <laughs> it was your car? Well, he didn't tell me it was your car. I remember it was burgundy. Was it reddish? Burgundy? What color was it? Well, honey, don't argue with me then. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I ran into a drunk post in the parking lot it ran right into the side of me twice anyway so I borrowed this car so you might be nervous if I borrow your car another fellow I was in uh, uh, in uh, Arizona the Palm Springs I was in Palm Springs preaching at a church and this fellow I didn't have the car. They got me there, and this guy goes, here, just use my uh, van. It's an old van, but you just follow us to eat. And I said, okay. So me and the <laughs> I've never told anybody this, so I'm going to tell you. It was a long time ago, hallelujah. But we're following, and we're in town, and there's a red light up there. And to me, it looks like it's about to change, and I'm slowing down, and he sped up. And I thought, well, we're going through it. I'm following him. And I kept going, and he slammed on his brakes, and I, boom, I hit him right in the back. I'm driving his car, and I hit his, his other car. I wrecked two of his car in one move. It was awesome. <laughs> he, faked, he faked me out, man. It was awesome. <laughs> yep. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't know that was your car. I Pretty sure he may be, I don't know. Do you think I wrecked your car too? <laughs> uh, I borrowed your car. Okay, well, I wrecked his car. Okay, now we got it right. I thought I wrecked two cars here. I didn't remember that. Okay, well, thank you for letting me use your car. It was very nice of you. I wrecked a maroon one kind of color. But all right. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 5 in your Bible, please. 2 Kings chapter 5. I've told churches that I love and that I go to, and like I came here, like I said, it was either, it could have been eight years in a row, but I came here several years in a row. Pastor Delaney said, Brother Dave, I want you to come the first Monday of January that you can come. If it's the first, if it's the third, if it's the fifth, I don't care. I want you to, because I don't come on Sundays back then. And uh, he said, I want you to come. And he goes, I want you to come as long as I'm living, as long as I'm alive. And so I came several years, and then God killed me, and I didn't come anymore. So, Well, he died. <laughs> so God's in charge, amen. 
God took him to heaven. I should have said it like that. That'd be sweeter. <laughs> but I do, I do like to surprise people and say that God killed him. Anyway, so I love him, and I love this church, and this has a great memory in my life and heart. So I'm thankful Brother Thomason would let me be here with you. All right? So if you're able, 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Wow. I'm going to spot read. If you're able, I forgot to ask you to stand. If you're able, I'd ask you to stand with me. We stand to give reverence and to give honor to the eternal, infallible, inerrant. It is the perfect, preserved word of the living God. Hallelujah. So, 2 Kings 5, I'm going to jump through some verses. I hope you'll see the pictures, you that have been here, of what we've done already. Verse number 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. The Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she, the little maid, said to Naaman's wife, her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is coming to thee, behold, I there was sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Verse 7. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes, and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Consider, I pray you, how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Verse 8, it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know there is a prophet in Israel. So, uh, verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again, uh, again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Verse 12, Are not Arbana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him, said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then, hallelujah, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Verse 15, and he, Naaman, returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it. <clears throat> um, but he refused, verse 17. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other little G-O-Ds, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Remon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Remon. When I bow down myself in the house of Remon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. That's all we're going to do tonight and get, uh, get done for tonight. But let me pray with you, please. Our great God, thank you again for the Holy Bible. Thank you for the truth of it. Thank you that we can trust it in every regard. Praise your name. Lord, I thank you for 
McKee Road Baptist Church and the hearts of these good people that would come to these services. Thank you. Would you, would you do it again? Would you speak to us? We're going to, we've already opened your word. We've already been reading it. It's obvious that you use your word to speak to us. So thank you. And then as I endeavor to try to get it across to preach, would you help me? That I could get this across and communicate that it would, that it would make sense to every one of us. And Jesus, for us that know you, that it would encourage us, it would strengthen us, it would help us. If we need it, that it would convict us, admonish us. I pray we'll listen with ears to hear. Anyone that's not yet born again, if you came back in the next 30 seconds, they'd be left behind. I pray for them that they would know their need, understand it. In Christ, I pray they would receive forgiveness from you as they receive you to be their forgiver, their Savior. I pray they do that before it's too late. Jesus, you're going to come back, and we believe it's going to be soon. We sure do look forward to when we get to see you. For it's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Trying to picture how Naaman looked and how he felt when he came up out of the water that seventh time. It'd be like impossible. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. It, Unless you've experienced that kind of miracle that you had leprosy and God miraculously healed you and it was obvious to everybody standing there, mercy sakes, it would be incredible. You would be on TV across the world. It would be awesome to try to say that. None of us have experienced that particular kind of miracle But many of us have been delivered from the clutches of the deadly infirmity of sin. Amen. Do you remember? Do you remember before you got saved how dirty you felt? Because you've come short of God's holiness and God's glory and you realize you're guilty. You're a sinner. You cannot save yourself. And it's it's embarrassing, it's humbling, it's heartbreaking to think that we have sinned against God. And then we're under this great conviction. Then, then happens. Then you let go of the few. Then you come to the end of yourself, your own ideas, your own religion, your own ways. Then you're willing to submit to anything, whatever. You're willing to part with anything. You're willing to do anything. You just want to be forgiven. You want to be cleansed. You, it's total surrender. <laughs> then, then you said yes to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Then you opened up your heart's door to Christ. Then, then he came in. It worked. It happened. You got forgiven. You got saved. Mercy. When I was a kid, uh, my dad was my pastor, and we, uh, I, I went to a small church called Grace Baptist Church. It was about, the auditorium was about this wide, and there was two rows of pews. There was a little aisle down the middle, and these pews were quite short. It might be a little bit more than this piece here, but it wasn't very much bigger than that. I had privilege, uh, Nancy now, it's more than 10 years ago, but Nancy and I were driving in Kentucky into Bowling Green where I grew up as a child, and my dad pastored there, and I took her by the place where I lived when I was from the age of four until I was 15, 
And then I took her to the elementary school I went to and showed her that where I played Little League Baseball. And I took her to the church building that I'm describing to you. A little frame building had um, rock stone on the side. It was just a wainscot though, only about six feet tall or eight maybe, I don't know. Had about five steps that went up to it. Had a fairly big porch, almost as big as the auditorium, the building. And uh, I pulled up and I said, I'd really love to go in there. There was a sign out there. It's a different flavor of church now that was out there. And there were some men working on the side over there, cutting down some tree limbs. And an old fellow was sitting on the porch. And I went up to him and I said, hey. I said, would you know the pastor here or know someone around here that I might could talk to and they might let me go in the building? He said, I'm the pastor. I said, my dad pastored here when I was a boy and this is where I got saved. Could we go in there? He said, sure. Uh, we got to go in. It, was, uh, it, it looked just like it looked when I left except that between the beams, I had something like these beams, but not that big, but they had these uh, rods that went across that were tied together, that screwed together that hold the all the buildings on the walls won't fall out that way. Yeah. Anyway, went down the stairs and showed Nancy where I went to primary church and uh, where I went to junior church or junior boys. We didn't have junior church back then, and I didn't get to go to high school there. But anyway, uh, I showed Nancy. Let me just tell you that on Wednesday we were having revival on Wednesday night of revival. I'm not yet nine years old. I'm almost nine. We had, how many rows are here? One, two, three, four, five. We didn't have ten rows. We must have had eight rows. Uh, but I was five rows back. One, two, three, got me sitting there where Brother Sterling is. And so I, uh, on Wednesday night, when they were having the invitation, my heart was telling me, you're a sinner, you know you're a sinner, you're going to hell, boy. I wasn't even nine years old, but I knew I was guilty before God. And I held on to the seat, and I was brokenhearted. I knew I should get saved. My dad was standing in the front. I wouldn't let go of the seat. I couldn't do it. I couldn't go up there in front of all those people. There's probably like 25 there. I couldn't do it. So I went home and cried myself to sleep, knowing I'm a sinner, I'm going to go to hell. Some people go, well, if you cried yourself to sleep, you didn't want to go to hell, and you knew Jesus was the Savior, you'd be okay. No, you can't do it your way, you got to do it his way. Thursday night, went back to this church, identical same thing happened. I wouldn't let go. During the day, of course, I went to school, and I kind of forget about it, and move to my business, and... Friday night of the, that revival, it was October 17, 1963. The same thing happened. I was standing there where Brother Sterling said, and I was hanging on to the pew. And God is convicting me that I'm a sinner. I was dirty. I was guilty. I knew he would save me if I would ask him, but I just couldn't. And finally, I let go, and I stepped out, started walking forward. If you'd have been there that night, you'd have seen me. I, I was crying. I was not crying because I was uh, scared. I was crying because I was a sinner. I was crying because I knew I needed to get saved. If you'd have been there that night, I was broken. I'm telling you, you would have went, oh, my goodness. He must have murdered 100 people. And that's how guilty I felt. And that's how guilty I was. Just as guilty as any other sinner. I didn't know all this. I was just a boy. Dad and I knelt down at the front, and I prayed. But what happened when I let go of the pew? That's when then happened. Then I let go of my ideas. I let go of my fear. I let go of what I thought. I let go of anything. I was willing to let go of everything and willing to say yes to Jesus. And when I got down here and asked him to forgive me, I asked him to come into my heart. It worked. <laughs> Hallelujah. He saved me. I've been saved ever since. I haven't, have I ever doubted it? Yeah, I've doubted it a few times. Sometimes my doubts were serious. I settled that when I was a freshman in college, praise God, but 
the reason I doubted so much because I'm so wicked and stupid. And I kept living like I wanted to live instead of like he wanted me to live. And I doubt, well, no one can be saved and act like me. But you can't work to, to get his favor. You get his favor by faith. You get salvation by faith, by receiving him. Not by being good enough, not by living nice enough and doing all the right things. It's just by faith, trusting him. Praise his holy name. Amen? That's what happened to Naaman. Then he went down. He said yes to what God's way, way was, to do anything, any way, whatever God wanted. Now, wait a minute. Let me back up a page. How did Naaman get down to the Jordan River? Well, Elisha told him. Oh, no, maybe you missed my statement, my question. How did Naaman get over to Samaria? Remember, because somebody cared. It was just a young girl. Amen? So I just want to put this picture in your brain. However long Naaman lived, Let's just say he's 45, and he lives for 30 more years. Do you know that every day that he saw and understood he didn't have leprosy anymore, don't you think there's a little girl's face that he saw in his mind every day or every time he saw her? He never forgot her face. I was thinking about that for me and you. Whose face do you see when you think about it? that moment that you finally let go, when then happened in your life, whose face do you see? I'll just go ahead and tell you, my dad was my preacher, and that night that I was standing there, uh, we had an old preacher, friend of dad's, come from Springfield, Missouri. He was the preacher that night. I don't see his face. When I think about his face, I say, I don't see my dad's face. My dad and mom were godly people. They taught us Jesus. They taught us salvation. They taught us all those things. But the truth is, the face that I see is the man who loved my dad. I had a privilege to meet him. Nancy and I got to be, he got to be our pastor for a few years. His name is David Kevin. Brother Kevin lived in El Reno, Oklahoma, and he was pastoring the Bible Baptist Church. My dad was in World War II, he was a sergeant in the Army. He got wounded, and he came to America, and he came to San Francisco, and he stopped there. And he lived in on a, on a two-story apartment or two-story house. It was an apartment, and he and his buddy lived upstairs, and this good-looking girl lived downstairs. She was like 17. She was awesome. So he started messing with her, trying to get to be nice to her, and win her over. And the day after she turned 18, they left San Francisco and drove to Reno, Nevada, and got married. That's my mama. <laughs> After he left San Francisco, they went to El Reno, Oklahoma. And dad is working as a carpenter. And Brother Kevin had met my dad. I'm not sure how that first initial meeting happened. But Brother Kevin kept after my dad said, Hey, JT, will you come to church this Sunday? Will you come and be my guest, be my friend? And my dad go, Yeah, yeah, I'll come. I'll bring the kids. He was lying through his teeth. He wasn't about to go. He just wanted to get him off his back. But every time, Brother Kevin kept talking to him, said, hey, would you, would you come to church this Sunday? JT, come on. You need to come to church. You need the Lord. You know what? I want you to come. And my dad would go, okay, okay, I'll be there. I'll, okay, I'll be there. And he knew he wasn't coming. My dad said, now, El Reno's not a big town. My dad said, when he saw Brother Kevin walking down the sidewalk, and he was on the same sidewalk, Dad would walk across the street, go into another store because he didn't want to talk to him because he knew he was going to try to get him to come to church. My dad finally went on Mother's Day in 1950. That's when Ben happened. Ben, he let go of the pew. He was sitting on the back row, his testimony is. He let go of the pew and he went forward and he got saved. God changed his life totally. Dad said he stuttered. I didn't know that he stuttered so bad. He said when he was, when he got saved, before he got saved, I can't believe he was a sergeant, but he, got, he stuttered so bad, he said, I couldn't say 
suey if the hogs were after me, is how he described them. And some of you don't know what that means, but anyway, I don't either. But he couldn't say it. Anything that started the S, he couldn't say it, or if it started the T, he couldn't say it. And he was, and then he would say a curse word, and then he'd say what he was trying to say. Is what that's his testimony. Anyway, God totally changed his life because God saved my dad that day. My mom got saved a little while later, but because Dad got saved that day, it changed. I wasn't even born yet, but it changed my life. That's where the cabin cares. I was thinking about. Whose face do we see? I see Brother Cabin. I'm glad he was our pastor for a while, Nancy. But then I was wondering, I wonder who sees your face when they think about when they got saved, when then happened to them. Does anybody see your face? And they go, oh, I'm so glad that they cared about me. I'm so glad they didn't give up on me. I'm so glad they cared. Anyway, Naaman sees this little girl's face the rest of his life. And Naaman, uh, because of this girl, is now in Samaria. Elisha gives him the cure. It is so simple, that's stupid. Elisha doesn't even go out and tell him. He sends a servant out there to tell him. Since we're talking about it, I might as well go ahead and throw this in. This is my last night. I'll preach as long as I want to, kind of. All right, now watch. Elisha doesn't go out. All that pomp and circumstance, that parade is out in front of his house. He doesn't even go outside. He just sends Gehazi, go tell him to dip in the Jordan seven times. That's what you tell him. I don't know if you're getting this or not. Many times, us preachers, I don't know if you know this, that preachers are humans. All the preachers I know are humans. So here's what humans have tendency to do. If a big wealthy entourage pulled up out front out front of the church building on Sunday morning preacher might be going oh my goodness (laughs) we might get all the bills paid and get ahead amen this would be awesome we're going to fix everything around here yes this could happen God could use it just think of the outreach we could have if God would bring them here. I'm sorry, hum- preachers are humans. There are some of you that are standing there going, did you see who's here? Oh, good night. Would that be wild if they would come to our church? Oh, mercy. And would you think about it too? It's kind of like being a human. But I love it. Elisha didn't even go outside. Go out there and tell him to dip in Jordan seven times. Here's the deal. None of us can be wowed or wooed by money, by power, by prestige. Are we humans? Yes, we are. But it can never, ever, ever be our motive to touch someone, to reach someone, hoping to get gain. That is totally upside down. Amen? Elisha is our illustration of that. So Elisha tells him to go dip in Jordan, and he is so bent out of shape. He's so mad about it. He goes, this is stupid. I thought he would come out here and, like, wave his hand over and call on the name of the Lord of God, and I'd be healed. I thought, and remember yesterday he started thoughting instead of believing? Many, many people have their idea of how you get to heaven, how you get forgiven, how you get cleansed, how you get right with God. And many people have their idea and they won't give up their idea because of their pride. It's got to be how... No, I ain't doing it that way. That's stupid. I'll just go ahead and be tacky since I'm not ashamed to be tacky. There are some people say, I'm stupid, bad, this. They have got it all messed up. They just think all you got to do is believe, pray, and ask Jesus, and boom, you get to go to heaven, and you don't have to ever live for God. You don't have to serve him. Just do whatever you want. Live however you want to. You still get to go to heaven. And they like to make fun of us because we believe once you get saved, like you're always saved. Once you get born, you can't get unborn. That's kind of wild thought, isn't it? We believe that. 
But they think that we think that all you got to do is use Jesus as a fire escape and then live how you want. That's not what the Holy Bible says. The Holy Bible says when we turn to him, we recognize who he is. And we're saying we're repenting, we're, we're, we're repenting, we're returning from that, and we're turning to him. And our intent, our heart is anything, I'm ready. I'm willing to do it. I just want to be forgiven of my sin. If you're not willing to do anything, you're not really humbled before him. You're going, well, I want to be, go to heaven, but I ain't going to stop doing what I want to do. Well, then you're not humble. Is everybody with me? Amen. You haven't surrendered to him. And so, but they, 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 other people would make fun of us and say, well, yeah, they're, they're crazy. Or, you know, we, we point our finger at other places, think, well, they think they're going to get to heaven because they got in the Wawa. Because they got in the Wawa, you get to go to heaven? Well, yeah, I got baptized, I'm going. And we tell, no, that's, that's not how you go. You got to do it Jesus' way. I don't know if anybody heard it, but he said, like, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've got to do it his way. You don't say, whosoever gets baptized gets to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Is everybody with me? So we just need to really go by the Holy Bible. But Naaman has all been out of shape, and he's mad about it. And he thought it would be his way. But, wait a minute, did Naaman ultimately surrender? When? When then happened, then he went down. So how can we prove our faith? How do we know that we know we believe? How do we know that? Well, let me say what it's not first. We don't prove our faith because we've told a whole bunch of people, well, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I know I am. How do you know you are? Well, I tell everybody I know I'm going to heaven. Well, there you go. That doesn't mean you're going. Well, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I told you the other day, maybe I told you, but in Oklahoma, everybody's a Christian. Everybody. Doesn't matter who they are, they're a Christian, and they know they ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior. Beep. How do they know that? It's inbred in them. It's everywhere. Everybody knows that. When someone talks to you about it, to get them off your back, you just say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I asked Jesus. I'm good. You know, okay. He said the right words. And just because you say it enough doesn't mean that you're forgiven. Huh. It's not by saying it over and over and over again. And here's one. It's not by saying, I've got peace. I can sleep at night. So I must be okay. I never have any trouble sleeping. I'm good. That doesn't mean you're born again. You're going to heaven. You're forgiven of your sin. Here's another one. Here's a, one that people love to use. It's some experience they had. I was in a bad car wreck. They told me I didn't even know it. The car rolled three times. <laughs> I was laying in there and I just said, God, save me. He did. That's why I'm still here. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. My baby was in the emergency room. My baby, I knew my baby got run over by a car and he was going to die. And I asked God, please don't let him die. Please don't let him die. And he didn't die, so I know I'm good. Is everybody hearing me? Whatever the, illness, the experience is, they think because they had an experience, something that was wonderful, that might be even supernatural, or something that they thought, well, evidently I'm okay. It is not that. The Bible says we've got to understand that we are sinners. Christ died for our sin. That's the whole reason he came, so he could die for our sin. No, 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 no. Not their sin. My sin. He died for us individually. You've got to get to the... That's why you feel guilty. That's why. That's why it's so uncomfortable, because you know it's you. It's because of you. It's your problem that he died for. Oh, uh, yeah, he died for you guys. It's too bad for you. No, he died for you, too. You can reject him, but he died for you. Amen. I love it. Here we go. Henry, how old are you? Eleven's a pretty good number. I was hoping, I knew you were ten. Thought I thought you were ten, I should say. I was kind of hoping you were nine, but 11 is okie dokie. Would you mind, would you help me a minute? Come on, come on, I want to show you. I want to show you guys, I want to show everybody. 
uh, just sit here just for a second. What did Naaman want when he got to Samaria? See, he wanted uh, the leprosy gone. He wanted to be healed. I'm pretty sure that was it. He just wanted the pain gone, the ugliness gone, the discomfort. He wanted to be cleansed of leprosy. That's all he wanted. Did anybody notice what he got? The Bible says when he came up that seventh time and he was cleansed and he had the skin of a little child. <laughs> no, no, no. All he wanted to do is have the leprosy gone. Where was the leprosy on his body? I don't know. Evidently, it was seeable. The little maid knew he had it. If he had it covered up, she may have never known. Was it on his neck? Was it on his face? Was it on his arms? Was it both places? Was it all places? I don't know. He had it. And I know when he came up, he didn't have it. And all he wanted was the leprosy gone. And when he came up, could he see it, that it's gone? Was it exposed? Was some of it still covered, or did he get in there with just his drawers on? I don't know. I know when he came up, it was gone. I also know this, Caleb. When he came up, he didn't have no mirror. He didn't go, whoa. He just was going, whoa. But I know this. Everybody standing on the bank went. I don't know what to say. I'll show you what I mean. Come here, Henry. Henry is 11, and I, I'm not belittling it, but you would still be called a child. You're not 19. <laughs> He's 11. I am not 40. And there is a difference between 40 and my age. <laughs> However, If I came up out of the water and I looked like this, <laughs> would this be awesome? This would be, this would be incredible. Amen? No, 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 no. Just look at our hands. Do my hands look older than yours? Mm -hmm. Well, quite a bit, don't they? Okay, all right. Is everybody getting it? I didn't write it. The Holy Bible says he came up Amen. with the skin of a child. <laughs> Hallelujah. What did he want? He just wanted the leprosy gone, but he got the whole package. Amen. Thank you, Brother Henry. Thank you very much. It's incredible. My brain just can't wrap around that. <laughs> I, I'm thinking when he... I, I, like he, okay, he looks at it and he's going, whoa, this looks different. Whoa, whoa, oh, baby. <laughs> he can't see the mirror yet. All the guys are going, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Here's what I mean by he got the whole package. It's like, it's like he got a new outlook on life. He got a new thanksgiving about life. He got a, a new purpose of life. He's got new intent about life. Is anybody hearing me? Yeah, I think, I think, I think it'd be okay to say this. It's like, it's like he became a new creature. Amen. <laughs> And that is exactly what happened to that eight-year-old boy, nearly nine, that got saved on October 17, 1963. I didn't know it. All I wanted to do was not go to hell. I got the whole package. I became a new creature. I got a new outlook, a new thanksgiving, a new intent, a new purpose, a new reason for living. And I'm not even nine, and I knew that it's something happened to me. 
I didn't know all that happened to me. I didn't understand redemption and eternal life and uh, sanctification. and I didn't understand all that beeswax. I didn't know any of it. I still struggle with stuff like that. But I know this. I got the whole package. It worked. Wow. Okay, let's try to conclude this thing, and let's work on the last verse that we have that we're going to do, verse 18 and 19, and then I'll wrap it up. <clears throat> well, we got to do verse 16. No, we got to verse 15. I'm sorry, we got to do all this. He returned to the man of God and all his company and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, take a blessing of thy servant. All right, uh, several things. He came back after he got healed. He just didn't run away and go, hallelujah, I'm on my way home. He said, I need to go back and tell that guy thanks. And then he said, I want to give him a gift. He now, no, before he brought all that money, he wanted to pay for it, but now he don't care. I just want to give you a gift. And I love it that he said, thy servant. He called himself the preacher's servant. And it is amazing when someone gets saved, they go, preacher, what do you want me to do? Where can we go? What do you want to do? I'm ready to do it. I'll go with you wherever you want to go. <laughs> it's awesome. He's the servant. And then he says, Will you take, take a gift? He goes, I, I will. He said, As the Lord liveth, I'll take I will not take it. And then this is a side note, but I believe one of the reasons that Elisha is trying to be adamant, I'm not taking it from you, because when you get home, Satan, the enemy, is going to try to put in your brain, Yeah, they took it because they took the money because that's how I got healed. He wanted him to know, No, 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 no. It had nothing to do with you and your goods and your money. God healed you by his grace and kindness. Everybody with me? That's one of the things. There's other little things inside there, but don't, I'm not going to take time. All right. So, now watch what he does to the next verse. This is cool. Verse, uh, he said, I'm not going to take it. Verse 17. He urged him to take it at the end of verse 16. He still said no. Verse 17. Naaman said, shall there not then... I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth. Watch this. For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other little G.O.D.s, but unto the Lord. Wow. Several things. First of all, I, sh I could have spent, I can spend minutes. I'm not going to. I'm just doing a couple seconds, a few seconds. I can spend minutes on he's willing to give. He's open-handed. People that get saved and God changes their life, people that God changes their life, they're willing to give. They're open-handed. They're not doing this. You ain't getting none of my money. You go, hey, I'll give whatever. I'm happy. Uh, I know we're human and we get away from God and we get out of sorts and we're not open-handed and God has to get a hold of our heart again. Anyway, okay. All right, now uh, he says, can I get two mules burden of earth? Why? Because I know there's no other God. There's only one God that's the God of Israel. What's his name? His name is jo Jehovah, Yahweh. Amen. There's only one God. And watch, and I will never offer sacrifice into any little G-O-D. I don't know if you're getting this. It sounds like he became a new creature. He's changed his outlook on everything. Then he says, I want two mules burden of earth. Why do you reckon that is? The only thing I can figure, because when he says, I want two meals burden of earth, he said, I won't sacrifice to any other little G-O-Ds, but unto the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So he's going to get home, he's going to spread that dirt out and make an altar place. That's the only thing I can gather. He wants the dirt. How much is two meals burden worth? That's a pretty cool word, isn't it? Two meals burden. Wouldn't that be cool to go to the store and say, I like a two mules burden of beans. <laughs> yeah. I think you're in the wrong century, Bubba. <laughs> so here we go. What is, a, what is a mule? How much burden, how much can a dirt can a mule carry? Well, uh, I actually tried to do some research. Here we go again. One fellow said he believed that a mule could probably carry 400 pounds, 200 on each side. You go, Probably carry. But what about? Yeah. <laughs> Who dare? Who dare? Okay, watch. All right, here we go. So, uh, 
400 pounds for a mule for 200 miles might be a little much. Most people would assume that a mule could carry 200 pounds. So two mules burden, 200 each, that's 400 pounds. I had uh, joy and privilege to get to hike the Grand Canyon. I went down from the north, uh, south side down to the river, and you go up to the river, and then you come back up the south side, and you do it all in one day, leave six o'clock in the morning, and so on. Anyway, while you're there, the path, there's, they kind of made a path, and when a, the donkeys are coming and they're carrying people down or carrying people up, you got to get out of the way and let them go. They got the right of way. So I wave at them, say hey to them. I say, hey, is your bottom sore? <laughs> you ain't used to riding no donkey, are you? Your bottom going to be sore for weeks. I was making fun of them carrying on. Anyway, so... These other guys came by. They, there were two men, and they were, both of them had two mules that were, they were dragging along, so that's four donkeys. And on the side of each donkey was a leather bucket. It looked almost like a, uh, 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 what do you call this thing you put apples in? A, a, a bushel. It looked like a bushel basket thing. But it was leather, and it was round at the bottom, but it was had an opening on it, and we're getting out of the way. I say, well, what's inside them bucket things? I said, dirt. Are you taking it out or taking it in? I said, we're putting it in. They said, when the weather comes and washes out the trail some places, we repair the trail. And so when you think of how much does 100 pounds of dirt how big a pile is that? That's a bummer. If you had a, a, a tire, just a tire laying there, and you filled up the tire, and you mount, I mean, the, you filled up the hole of the tire and mounted it up real high, about this high, that'd be somewhere around 100 pounds. So if you move the tire out of the way, it's not going to get too high. And then if you got 200 pounds, well... 400 pounds is really not that much. But he's going to spread that around and make an altar. I'm just trying to tell you, God changed him. He said, there's only one God, and I will not offer sacrifices to little G-O-Ds. I'm telling you, he, he became a new creature. Here's the last, uh, verse 18, and then we'll do 19. 19 is just, and he says, go in peace. So, verse 18. He asks, he brings it up to Elijah. It's not even a question, actually. It's a statement. Verse 18. And this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. And when my master goeth into the house of Remon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Remon. When I bow down myself in the house of Remon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. Elisha says in verse 19, go in peace. All right, here we go. What is that about? Naaman is saying, when I get back home, my master is the king Ben-Hadad. When I get home, my king is going to say, come on, Naaman, we need to go to the house of Ramon. We need to go worship. Come on. And why would he do that? Because Naaman has done it before. He's been with him before. It's obvious. He's going to ask me to go. In fact, he's going to lean on me to go. And when I go, and I bow myself, you said, Brother David, he just said he would offer no sacrifice to any other little GODs. He's not offering sacrifice. He's going into the building. He's going into the place. And he's going to, he said he's going to want me to bow down. And I bow myself. The Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. That's what he's saying. Is it okay? Am I going to be okay? Is there going to be a problem here? Is everybody hearing that? Why would he even bring that up? He's a new creature. He's totally different. His religion ain't his religion no more. Is everybody hearing that? 
All right, now I'm an independent fundamental. We got in fear and devil, hate and Bible, believe in Baptist. I've been one all my life. My dad was my preacher. I grew up in this kind of environment. We believe the Holy Bible. We believe God's Word is the only way. And you've got to go by God's Word. You can't go any other way. We're not changing it. We're not changing it for anybody. Hallelujah. That's right. And that's how I was raised. And I will tell you, I'll just say, Mr. Caleb, you get saved and you're doing really good, but then you say, hey, Brother Dave, Christmas time, I'm going, or this summer, you could say, I'm going to go see my other grandma, and uh, she's Catholic, and she's going to want me to go to church with her. And we always have in the past, now that I'm saved and everything, what do you, what do you, what do you think I should do? Go to, go to church with her? Is everybody hearing me? Now, that, that kind of stuff happens all the time for new Christians and so on. They're thinking, when I go see my mother, when I go see my dad, when I go see my sister, I don't know what to do, I don't want to do what to do. So, as an independent Baptist like I am, normally I would say, well, no, you can't go to her church. You've got to maintain your testimony, brother. You've got to use your testimony. You find you a good Baptist church up there, and you go and you tell her she ought to go with you. Because you're saved now. They don't, they don't show people how to get saved the right way and all that stuff. And you're going to be a good testimony. Says, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'm serious. That's exactly what I would have done in the past until I prepared this message. You know what Elisha said? Don't worry about it. Go in peace. <laughs> now, I'm the pastor going, oh, now, I don't be thinking you ought to be doing that because you get all mixed up. You might start being a Catholic again. Come on now, man. You know. Is everybody hearing me? I'm just a crybaby. And I'm a human, and I want to do it my way. But Elisha, the man of God, said, go in peace. Don't worry about it. I got to thinking about why would he say don't worry about it? Well, I think that is, he, no, no, it's obvious he's a new creature. God changed him, remember? It's obvious that name is different. He's thinking about stuff he's never thought about. Number two is that Elisha could say, no, don't, don't think about that. Don't worry about it. Because Elisha knows something he don't know. Elisha knows when he gets home and he walks in front of the king and the king goes, whoa, whoa, I, it worked. And you look so young. Now Elisha knows that the king could look at him and go, mercy, I guess there is no other God than the one in Israel. And never, ever bring up Ramon. You hearing me? Because when Elisha sees how God's changed his life, I mean, Ben-Hadad sees how God changed his life, Ben-Hadad ain't going to say, hey, I know you're different, but you still need to come with me. Because they know something happened to you. Is everybody with me? The other flip side of that is, if Ben Haydad still wants you to go with him, don't worry about it. Just maintain your testimony. Go with him. Do what you do. You already said you're not going to offer sacrifice. Everybody with me? So I'm almost done, but I, I do think we ought to think about it. What do you think about Mrs. Damon when he walks in the door? He walks in the door, and he used to be 40, and now he looks like he's 11 or 12. <laughs> what? He's a grown man. He's just got the skin of a kid. Are you hearing me? I can almost hear her say, honey, 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 I've been using Mary Kay for years. <laughs> I've been to Ulta several times. There ain't nobody got what you got. That's incredible, isn't it? Do you think she knows that she got a new man? Yeah. I preach at the Master's Men every year now. I don't think I'm on year 25 or 26 this coming May. Wow. Often, I speak at other men's places, but often I will tell the men these words. Hey, boys. Hey, hey, Bubba. Hey, wait, stop, stop. I said, if God gets a hold of you, and he changes your heart. You get saved or you rededicate your life to him. If he gets a hold of your heart, when you get home, you don't have to open the door and say, hey, honey, come here. 
You got a new man here. You don't have to say a word. When you walk in the door in just a couple of minutes, she'll know, whoa, something happened to him at that, at that men's meeting. Is everybody hearing me? It's just like when someone goes to revival and gets on fire for God and turn on, and they go to work the next three days, and at work they're going, what happened? Why are you different? Amen. That's what happened to Naaman. God totally changed him. Well, I'd love to see that kind of revival in our lives and our hearts. I ask you to stand with me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Wow. I'd like to 